I'm Nazreen Zahab, and I'm here with my 18-month-old son, Abdul Rahman. I think every case has its own story, and I really honestly believe I did nothing wrong. I didn't willingly walk into a war zone, nor did I willingly stay. Tell me how you ended up in Syria. That's quite a story. So, I think I was 21. I think I was 21. The last time I saw my mum, actually, was, I was 21. And we were in Lebanon on a family holiday. It was going good. We were there maybe for two weeks. My dad came out. My sister was close. She was meant to come out. My brother, I think, was coming out. It was meant to be like a family thing. I'd stopped uni. We were on holidays. So we were all coming out to Lebanon to see my grandma. And then every day we drove past this sign that said Syria. And like it tells you to go that way. So like it was really like sad for us to say that we're going home. And then there's a sign that says Syria. It's, it's so close. But like you know what they're going through. We couldn't help but feel guilty that we got to go home every night to our families and hot meals and like to safety. And the people in Syria were like going through hell. So we thought the next, next, like, the next best option for us was to go and at least see the people in Lebanon, like the Syrian refugees. So we tried to do that. So we had our little plan and we got connections with a man in Turkey. He was Australian also and he had his own humanitarian thing going on. So we just asked if we could just go meet the Syrians, which, you know, maybe pack a couple of boxes, give some food out, you know, make yourself feel better, something for another human. So we got into our flight and we got to Turkey and we contacted this brother. And from then, we were apparently meant to go see Syrians in Turkey. But then I ended up in Syria. Did you know you were going into Syria? Of course not who walks into a war zone. I was going to say Syrians, yes, because of what they're going through. I'm not the type that picks up and leaves. I had a whole family. I had a whole thing going on. I was doing uni. I had everything. If anything, my mum knows what I packed in my bag was nothing. <laughs> I wasn't planning on leaving. I was only coming back. It was meant to be a little thing where you go see them, you do something to make yourself feel better, that you help these Syrians, and you come back. You're not meant to go become the Syrian in Syria. So when he took you to his house, yeah. that was crossing? Apparently, yeah. That was it, that's it. And then you get to his house, and he takes your phone and your passport, and khalas, you don't have any connection to the outside world. When they asked me for my passport, that kind of freaked me out. And then my cousin's like, maybe it's just for paperwork. Like, maybe we actually have to get to an area and we need paperwork for the, like, she's freaking out with me, but, she tried to reassure me because she knows I would never, ever want to do this. And I want to do humanitarian aid work, but like, <laughs> I'm like to a limit in things. I'm like, okay, we'll do this, and that's it. I don't push further. So when they asked for my passport, I freaked out, of course. And when they took my phone, I had a heart attack. But I didn't realize until, like, I was there until I seen a flag the next morning. It was a nice flag. And then that's when you find out. And you realise that you're kind of stuck. And there's nothing you can do. Anymore. What did you know about ISIS at the time? I'll be honest, not much. <laughs> Even our media in Australia didn't really cover much about it. All I knew was like, the bad people. That's what it was portrayed as. To me, it was the bad people. And that's all I knew about them. I didn't know anything about them. But seeing the flag, your heart instantly drops. Because now you know that from here onwards, you can't even be you anymore. You have to comply with their, like, you have to hide who you are. So, when you were taken in, my understanding is you were taken to a house 
where women were. Can you explain that yeah. to me, please? And, and tell me what it's called. So we'll take an in. It takes you a while to figure out where you are. You ask a couple of questions and you find out you're in, I think it was something, some area like that. And it's just a house full of women. You walk in and they get this metal detector. And I'm just, I'm walking in like, what the hell is happening? And this lady just metal detects you and then you have these other ladies screaming at you because you're uncovered like this. And yeah, she pretty much metal detected me. And I just sat. And my thing is, I go into shock. So I just go quiet. And I just, you don't know what to do, you go numb. So I'm just waiting, like, okay, what happens now? I can't tell anyone where I am. I can't talk to anyone. I can't tell my mom I'm okay. I had no contact with my mom for a couple of hours and knowing my mom, she's freaking out. And I'm never like that with my mom, I'm very close. But like, I won't even go to the shops without her. I take her everywhere. <laughs> so being away from her for a couple of hours is scary. But the whole way I was always like, I'm all right, mom, don't worry, I'll be okay. Don't worry, mom, like, you know, we're not doing anything crazy, we'll, just, we'll be back. So yeah, when I was in that house, there was no contact to the outside world. It was just you in their world. And then they ask you, are you married? And I'm like, no. They're like, okay. And then I start to freak out even more because I never want to get married. If anyone knows anything about me, I was never going to get married. <laughs> My mom was always like, we have to get you married and you have to buy these things. I'm like, no, don't talk to me. I'm never getting married. That was me. I was very dramatic about it. So this lady comes and she's like, are you married? And I'm like, no. And she's like, and I get defensive. And she's like, okay. And she asks my cousin, are you married? And she's like, no. And then she gathered a couple of us. And she's like, all right, so you're unmarried, you're going to have to go to another house. That was actually good. It was the night before I slept under stairs. And there was a house packed with women and cats and dirt and feces and poo. And it was just really disgusting. So her taking us to another house, I was like, all right, we'll see what happens. There was women there when I got there that had been there for months. So me, I was hopeful. I'm like, I don't have to get married. Everyone else is telling me, no, you have to get married. You want to get out of here? You have to get married. You want to talk to your mum? You have to get married. You want to do this? You want to get back to where you came from? You have to get married to get out. And I'm like, I don't want to get married. <laughs> I didn't come here to get married. I don't want to get married. I don't even have family. I don't have a wedding dress. I have nothing. What do you want me to get married with? And they're like, no, no, you have to get married. You have to get married. So I'm just like, all right, I'll give you the hard thing. They come around with the paper and they're like, Tell us what you want in a husband. I'm like, he has to be taller than me. And they're like, oh, you're very tall. But I'm just me I'm messing with him. I don't actually want to get married. So they're writing, oh, he has to be taller than me. How tall are you? And I'm like, I'm this sister. And they're like, okay. And they're, <laughs> and they're like, where does he, where do you want him from? I'm like, he has to be Australian Lebanese. They're like, oh, that's hard. I'm like, don't you want me to get married? That's the only thing I'm going to marry. Tall Australian Lebanese class. And they're like, all right. And then they speak for a couple of days. <laughs> and they sent me a Syrian guy. No, that's crazy. So you, what, you're brought into a room with him? Yeah. You, they, this random man takes you with his wife. And this other lady takes you. And he walks in, the man walks in. And then you sit and he sits. And then they begin to ask you questions. And because I was like, my daddy's little girl. And I was so spoiled. And I never ever expect to be in Syria. So this guy sits and he thinks he's like something big. And he goes to me, don't think you're going to be treated like a princess anymore. And I'm like, what the hell? Who the hell are you? I don't even know you. Get out of my face. You know my daddy's? <laughs> and I'm like, got really defensive because I'm like, I have four brothers and a dad. And this random man is like, I'm not going to be a princess. I am a princess. So, and I had a fight with him. Like, Did you want to do that? Did I want to marry him? In the time, like in the circumstances I was, that was like a saviour. Something that saved me, or something I was in. Would I do it again? I don't know. In your own house, what was life like? Normal. Completely normal. You wake up to breakfast, you make lunch, you have dinner and you go to sleep. If you're not running away from moms. But <laughs> in the beginning it was really good. It was normal, normal, normal life. You get to know this new guy and then you slowly fall in love. And then you just, your life just goes on. You're forced to live something so you just make the most of it. 
you talk to your parents and you can't tell them anything because if you do then you're in trouble you put him at risk you put you at risk from both ends that was just me and my husband and anything on the outside didn't matter like that's what was happening outside could I get out of where I was no so you, what you do is you just live with what you have you have your house you stick to your house you you don't look for what you don't want if that makes sense That was the worst year of my life. with a baby and with no men support and at the end they like everyone has a guy to fall back on like you need water your husband gets it for you you need food your husband gets it for you or he'll figure someone out to get it for you when you're by yourself and you have a baby who does anything for you like you can only expect so much from someone that's not your husband so that was really hard and being a first time mom, and I waited so long to get pregnant. So when I finally got pregnant, it was like a really big deal for me. And then he didn't meet his dad. And my son's 18 months old now, and he'll probably never meet his dad. So to me, that was hard enough. And then coming back into a war zone with him, the guilt was really bad. And like, you know, like it's time to feed your son. Your son's four months old, and you want to give him like, you know, a bit of solid. And there's nothing for you to even eat. What are you going to feed him? A banana? Dream on, they're not gonna find a banana. You wanna give him an avocado? There's no avocado, there's nothing. And he'd always get really sick. And then I was always running around for medicine. I became like a doctor, now give me a needle and I'll poke you with a needle. I figured everything out, I'm like I don't need these people. It was really hard going back with the baby. And winter was hard. It was just something I don't like to remember. The community thinks we're a threat, but really, I just exposed my face. So who's going to be followed in the street now? Who's going to be threatening me or my kids? Whose name is up on the news? Me. So I'm going to be threatened. Like, would I really, if I was a threat, would I really put myself at threat? Wouldn't I hide and not even say who I was? I'm putting myself out there and telling you I'm not a threat. Come ask me all the questions you want. I'll give you all the answers you want. And I have nothing to hide. There's also the potential, if you go home, for any of the Australian women, if they go home, that they might be charged, uh, sent to jail. What do you think about that? I think every case has its own story. And I really honestly believe I did nothing wrong. I didn't willingly walk into a war zone, nor did I willingly stay. If anything, I tried to leave all the time. And when I did leave, they sent me back without even saying hello. So how can they even say? Like, I understand they have their laws, but I'll abide by them, go for it. Like, go for it. But I did nothing wrong. And I'm not doing anything wrong. And I don't plan to do anything wrong. I just wanna go home. I understand that they have to take their measures like legally and for the community and for the safety but do that and as you're doing that take us home like you want all these laws we're gonna abide by your laws you don't want us to talk to this person we won't talk to this person you know i won't even leave my house just get us out of this area take us to actual safety and then tell me that you don't want us to pose a threat because we're not posing a threat and you're leaving us in threat like we told you what happens and you're just like yeah we're just waiting for australia <laughs> like fire out, we get it, you're waiting for it, you want safety, we also want that safety. Like we deserve it just as much as you. So you're saying that 
by leaving them, by leaving you and by leaving the children here, you think you you and they are being exposed to more. Uh, they were worth exposed to. Yeah, of course. There's children that are just beginning to like understand the world. Like Khalid, he's young. By now he'll walk around and he'll just pick up something that someone else said. He'll say it without knowledge. Eventually, leave him here for another two years. What's he going to learn? You don't want a threat? We don't want to be a threat. We're not a threat. The longer you leave him here, these kids are going to learn things that we didn't teach them. And they learned it because you left them here. Do you understand what I mean? Like, the longer you leave them, the more doors you open for the kids to go through. You want to close those doors? Take them home. Give them a door to actually close. 